Amen. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what do you do when you get discouraged. I, I tell you, the first thing that you don't do is give up on God, right? Never give up on God. Um, I've been a pastor here 18 years, and, and there's been many times that, that I've, I've gotten discouraged. And, uh, um, but I knew one thing, it, was, it has never been God's fault. God has never let me down. Sometimes people let you down. It's a fact, right? Because they're human beings. Sometimes people that um, at one time had your back, then they, then they don't. You know, that can cause discouragement. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever go through that? Um, and uh, there's all kinds of things that can um, sort of get in the way. If you're fighting um, health issues, don't get discouraged. You keep fighting and you keep believing in God's power to make you well. And I like to put it like this. Where would you be if you had not trusted God and had served God and, and um, put your faith in him? Where would you be? Some of you might not even be here. So your, your glass of water is half full, not half empty, right? You're not what you used to be. You're not quite where you want to be. You're somewhere in the middle going this way, going in the right direction. That's the way you have to reshape your mind because God's promised you he would never leave you nor forsake you. We have to understand we live in a planet with a curse on it. Yes. And, and hurting people hurt others. And the Bible says that um, Jesus said that evil will get in the hearts of men and women. That's why you see a lot of terrible things going on out there. We have a lot of terrible politicians out there that are just trying to take the country in a whole different course, a whole different way. And, and uh, we, we're the church. We're to stand up against that. And, and, and if someone says, well, Pastor, I don't want you to talk about politics. And this isn't the church for you then. Amen, because the sheep are not to lead the shepherd. Amen, and we have to talk about these issues. I'm obligated to talk about whatever issue the Holy Spirit tells me because the world is, is conf the, the world system and the political system and all that garbage is polluting the minds of God's children. And they're, and they're losing faith and they're getting afraid. And so I'll stand up and I'll go ahead and say, hey, it's okay to believe in everything the Bible says. Amen. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Who's with me, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to be standing before some politician when it's all said and done at the judgment seat of Christ. It's not the judgment seat of the president of the United States. No, he'll be there too. Judge. Yep. <laughs> and so, I mean, we, are, we have an obligation to Jesus. He's our Lord and Savior. And so we have to stand up and, and be counted. And it's not the time to, to lose your voice. And, and so many Christians have been beat down. It started right in about 2016 where it started getting really rough. And, 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 uh, and then it just, they just poured it on with uh, political correctness. I mean, you couldn't talk unless they approved it. I've never been a politically correct pastor, so I just want you to know that. I probably can't run for office unless there's a lot of um, Christians voting, <laughs> right? And so, but I'm not interested in being politically correct. Amen? And there's some things the world wants us to do. They want us to change the way we think. They want us to change what we believe. They want us to, they want us to change our words. I've made a commitment, the world will not cause me to pervert my speech. Amen. I'm not going to pervert my speech and go along, just, what, what's that saying, um, go along just to get along or whatever. No, I, I, I'm going to concentrate on Jesus. Because the world and the politicians are worried about offending everyone but God. When's the last time you heard, oh, well, we've got to watch out for the Christians? I've never heard that. You know, well, we'll watch out for ourselves. And we got a big God and a big Abba Father who will take care of us. Amen. And so that's what this message is about. It's about sticking to the Word of God and, and keep going in spiritually because God's doing a great work. 
Even though you can't see it and you can't feel it sometimes and it doesn't look like it's happening, God is on the move. And he needs churches just like this all over this country to stand up and get some backbone. And to not be afraid. I mean, we're putting all our messages that go out on YouTube and Facebook and, and everything like that because we have freedom of religion, right? We still have that, right? All right, so far. And freedom of speech. And, and uh, so um, we're going to declare what the Lord tells us to declare. But we're not trying to start a fight with the world. The world is the harvest. But there are certain segments of society that, that have jumped over our fence and got into our yard <laughs> and are knocking out our windows and telling us, you sit down and be quiet. We know what's best for your children. Oh, no, that ain't happening. <laughs> right? They're not telling us what's best for our children. You know, so we say to the schools, teach reading, writing, and arithmetic, and good, good history, right? Don't add your political agendas in there. I don't know why, like I said, I don't know why people get mad sometimes at pastors if they have to talk on certain subjects, but they say nothing about the schools getting political and, and, and pushing their agendas with the, with the stuff that they do. They get a pass. Well, we're going to keep telling what the Lord tells us to say, right? And so um, the sheep don't lead the shepherd. And uh, I'm the pastor of the church. That's true. But I'm not everyone's pastor in the church. You have to give me that place. Amen. If you pick and choose and one Sunday I'm on, the next Sunday I'm off. No, maybe you're off. <laughs> right? I mean, where's the honor? Where's the respect? This is God's house. And people think the churches are little sweet democracies. No, they're not. They're hierarchies. God is the leader of it all, and the Holy Spirit rules this place. Amen? Amen? And he works through structure, and he works through order that's defined in the Word of God. We follow his plan. It's not even the popular opinion rules. It's what the Word of God say rules. Right? We've been doing it that way for 43 years. It's worked so far. You know? We're not um, held in bondage that I can't preach a message because, oh, so-and-so might not like it. And, and they, give, they give a lot of money. A lot of churches get caught up in that. We're not caught up in that. God supplies all of our needs. Amen? When this church first got out here and they built this, this, um, this building and got this property, the Lord told my dad, he said, look, you, get, you go to the bank and get the financing and I'll make every payment. I'll make every payment. And some people say, you know, the Bible says don't get in debt. It's not talking about financing a building or it's, it's talking about pay your bills. Right? And uh, God's made every payment. But right as soon as we started here, there was an assistant pastor in the church and, and a little group, a little group that heard from God more special than everybody else. Don't get me started. <laughs> but anyway, rose up. We're, we're leaving. We're starting our own church. And, and they left. And, and the last thing they told my dad was, you'll never be able to make that payment now. The very next Sunday, the offering doubled. God supplies our needs. So I'm just saying this. I'm not held captive by anybody's opinion or any, anybody's pressure. I, I'm held captive by the Spirit of the Lord. And uh, if you can't see my heart by now, you'll never see my heart. If you don't know me as a person and, and trust me, then, then you probably won't ever. And if you don't trust me, then what, what are you doing here? <laughs> Go find a place. Because I ain't leaving. <laughs> and one thing about a church, remember this, when people get offended in a church, it, that happens. And so you have, you have options. When you get offended, you can, you can make it right, and you can try to figure it out, which is a good thing. 
But if the offense is too much to overcome, you can leave. That's fine. But you don't have, this is the option you don't have, to stay in the church offended. You don't have that option. You know, if you, if you love Jesus, if you love him and love what the, the sacredness and the holiness of churches, then, then, then if you can't get, a, get along and you can't work it out, go find yourself another church. All right. I'm glad you're here, brother. <laughs> but we, we got to come into an agreement. That's where the power of God comes down. Amen? Anybody think that the Holy Spirit's going to move in spectacular uh, fashion if we have the Hatfields and McCoys? <laughs> For the younger people, Google it. You'll find out about it. Hatfields over here. McCoy is over here, you're giving stink eyes here, and they're giving mean mugs over here. And, and I'm like, hey, <laughs> you know, we don't want that. If God is not the author of confusion, who is? And so we serve him. But it's time for, for God's children to, to um, put their boots on, lace them up, and, and get to work. Amen. I mean, if what's happened over this last year and a half or, or, or hasn't, hasn't um, affected you, I mean, my goodness. End time stuff happening. End time stuff alert, right? <laughs> happening. My, I just have a different opinion. I believe that the church will hold down the fort here in the United States until Jesus comes back. <laughs> I believe the stage is being set but I believe that that Antichrist spirit is trying to poke his head out too soon. He only has seven years. And I believe he will be defeated and turned around even now. And he'll go underground. That, that terrible Antichrist spirit will go underground and, and resurface when the church is out. But everything the Bible says is going to happen in the last days, you're seeing it happen. You're seeing the, the, the beginnings of it. And so... If you're on Team Jesus, you're on the right team. Amen. But I want to show you a scripture here. Look at um, Galatians chapter 6. And I, and I want you to know, um, coming into this as a pastor 18 years ago, if you can't remember I've been a pastor 18 years, I say it enough, you probably, you probably have it memorized. I, I was so, like, uh, sensitive and if the Holy Spirit, sometimes the Holy Spirit has the, the pastor do some correcting and some corrective teaching, right? <coughs> I'm not calling everybody lugheads and yelling at them. But I was so, like, tenderoni. And I go home to my wife and say, is that too hard? <laughs> and she said, no, I loved it. Keep it up. <laughs> but, you know, I've matured. And, and like I said, I love everyone in here. And if you come through those doors, you, I have an accountability for you. Amen. Now, if you go and leave because we're not the place for you, that's fine. You know, but if I push you out because of the way I treated you in, in a not godly manner, you know, then I'm accountable to the Lord. It's a high accountability. And so that, that's how I um, approach things. But I, I just want to see you do well. I want to see the church do well, and I want to push forward, you know, in the middle of the coronavirus when we were not even having church. That's when the Lord said, build that building. Got it built, didn't we, by the help of the Lord. It's built. If you haven't seen it yet, just walk on over there. Go right back the hallway. Go right in. If you want, I'll take you for a tour. I love giving tours. <laughs> so, um, and now, you know, just when I get settled in again, he says, okay, now it's time for a school. I'm like, yeah, but, you know. Don't I even get a little break, a little breather? <laughs> and then I've learned a long time ago, whatever the Lord has for us to do in our individual life or in a, a corporate life, it's going to take a leap of faith to get there. Amen. You get bored if you're not living by faith, if you're not answering the call or the challenge that God gives you to do, because God has a work for all of us. So look at Galatians 6, 7. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also 
reap. That's an established law. That's a, a physical, natural law. You sow corn, you're going to get corn, right? But it's also a spiritual law of seed, time, and harvest. And so here, here's how we sow as believers, or not, how we're not to sow. Look at verse 8. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will reap of the Spirit everlasting life. So as a believer, you can still sow to the flesh. You can still act on that lower, carnal, earthly, sensual, and devilish uh, nature in your physical and in your mind. You can still do that. If you gossip, you're sowing to the flesh. You know, gossip is the number one sin that God hates the most. You know why? Because it assassinates people's character. And it's hurtful. And, and, it, and it, nothing will harden the, the heart quicker than gossip. So he says, um, but you can sow to the Spirit. How do you sow the Spirit? Keep coming to church. Keep reading your Bible. Keep walking in love. Learn to forgive those who have hurt you and those who have disappointed you. Sometimes it's hard to forgive people. Am I the only one? What do you do when it's so hard? that it's beyond your natural ability to forgive. Because we can, if you can get hurt that, that much, I hope it hasn't happened to too many of you in here, but it can happen. Well, do what Jesus said. Pray for them. Let me tell you something about, this is how you sow to the Spirit. When you pray for people that have hurt you, supernaturally inside, the things of God will start to, to manifest and take shape. Because the Bible says that the love of God's already been shed abroad in your heart. The Holy Spirit's in there. And so you have supernatural ability. And anytime you act on the word of God, it kicks in the anointing or the power of God to do it and to give you the ability to do it and give you the results. But you have to, make, you have to humble yourself. And you have to say, you know what? I am going to forgive. I, a lot of people don't want to forgive because they think the people that they're forgiving will get away with it or something. They're not going to get away with anything if they don't repent. But you don't want to see them in hell, do you? That's a terrible place. And hurting people hurt others. And so when you pray, the Holy Spirit will give you the heart for that person. Try it. You know, the Bible says, God says, prove me with the tithe. Prove me. I, I dare you. Go ahead and start tithing. See what I'll do off your tithe. Well, it's the same way with, with forgiveness. If, you, if there's someone that you have trouble forgiving, spend this week 10 minutes a day praying for that person. Just don't say, bless them. <laughs> no, literally, like, say something nice. <laughs> Even if it's like, Lord, open their eyes, help them to see. Lord, uh, I don't want anything wrong to happen to them, but Lord, may surround them with people that will love them and, and, and um, heal what's inside of them. Because if they hurt you that bad, trust me, they're hurting themselves. And you start praying like that, you'll be released. That's what forgiveness means, to be released. Check it out in the Greek. It means to be released. What was in them didn't get in you. But you've got to take the effort. Let's look at verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So don't grow weary doing good and sowing to the Spirit. You're going to reap. You're going to reap because you're sowing seed. Every time you come to church and you put a smile on your face and you join in with this body of believers, you are reaping. You're going to reap a harvest. Like today, you're going to reap a harvest from this, from this meeting today. You might not feel it immediately or understand it, but you are. God's putting something in you right now because you're doing exactly what he said to do. Look at the people, the believers that struggle the most. What's one thing they all have in common a lot of times? They left the church, whatever church, and they got out by themselves. You weren't called to be out there by yourself. You weren't called to be the Lone Ranger. You were called to be in the body. Out there is where you get whacked. 
right? <laughs> I don't know why that word came up, but that's a good word. Out there's where the devil can, can get, get to you. You watch these National Geographic shows and, and the lions, who do they get out of the herd? The scragglers, the ones that are left behind and the ones that are out of the pack. And so, but so many times, I've gone to prisons and, and talked to many people and many young men. And I'll talk to them about the Lord. And these guys in prison, they start to cry. And they feel shame. I could see it. They feel shame for what they've done. They're not bad people. They just um, got um, lost in their way. And, uh, but I'll ask them about their journey with the Lord. And immediately, they'll all light up and say, yeah, I used to go to church with my family. And we used to go to church, but then for some reason, mom and dad stopped going. And then, and then they, they got a divorce, and, or this or that, and, and, and then I got into the wrong crowd. That's why we have all these programs to help your kids not get in the wrong crowd. Pastor Dane's here every Wednesday, ready for your teenagers, every Wednesday, to love them and to teach them and to encourage them. We need each other, don't we? Look at verse 10. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Look at this. Especially. Some will say especially. especially. I like that word. Especially. <laughs> to those who are of the household of faith. That'd be us right now, right? Amen. You're to be especially good to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not talking about making me a cheesecake either because I don't, I don't need it. <laughs> but you know what? I'm to be especially good to you. You're to be especially good to your neighbor, to your left, and to your right, to, to behind you, in front of you because that's what brings the light. That's what brings the love. And that's the first thing the world recognizes when they come in amongst us. They see that unity and that harmony and that love. Yeah. Amen? I like what the passion... Bible says about verse 10, it says, and don't allow yourself to be weary in planting good seeds. For the season of reaping the wonderful harvest you've planted is coming. Amen. That's why we show up every Sunday and, and, and Wednesday, and Sunday night. We have church tonight, Sunday night. We have our power tonight. And uh, because we know that we're planting good seed and we're sowing into the kingdom of God. And, you know, pastors and pastors' wives and leaders of the church, we're human too. There's been some services that we've stood up here and we've preached and we've brought the word that terrible, had a terrible week. Terrible. And Leslie learned right on, early on, she says, how can you do that? No one would ever know what kind of week you had. Because I'm, I'm serving God. And it's not about me right now, it's about you. It's about me telling you what God's already fed me so you can go out and apply it to your life. But as I keep planting those seeds, God keeps taking care of me. But too many people are fickle, you know, too fickle. You know, they, they don't appreciate the, the holiness and the preciousness of, of being in a church. Amen. Come on now, why'd you get me started? They don't, they don't appreciate it. This isn't just some club like the Elks Club or Moose Club or nothing, nothing against those places, you know. This is God's house. Amen. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in each and every one of us. We are brothers and we are sisters in Christ. God called us to do a work together. That means you better get over yourself. Right? Uh-oh. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19. This will be New Living Translation. I wanna, I, I've been meditating on Elijah. Elijah was a great man of God, was he not? Now this, this account here comes off of the heels of a great victory that Elijah had on Mount Carmel. Um, fire came down out of heaven 
and destroyed the altar that was drenched with water and all the prophets of Baal and Asherah were, were, were killed because Ahab made a, a crucial mistake, the king of Israel. You know what he did? Mary Jezebel. <laughs> God said, don't bring no foreigners into the, into the fold here because what they do is they corrupt the things of God. And, and uh, she did. All those false prophets, all those um, wicked ways were, were causing Israel to, to suffer. It hadn't rained in three and a half years. And Elijah comes up there and he says, look, who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the God of Israel? Or are you going to serve those prophets who could not call fire down out of heaven? He wanted them to make a choice. And so... When the fire came down out of heaven and burned up the altar, like Elijah prayed for, and he had the prophets, the false prophets killed. Now, this is Old Testament. We're not talk talking about going out and killing anybody, right? And uh, um, Ahab, King Ahab, went home and told Jezebel. I guess she ruled the roost because she wasn't happy. And she said, you mark my words, he's going to be dead by this time tomorrow. She told Elijah that, and, and he got discouraged. That Jezebel spirit is a very discouraging spirit. And that's what we're facing today, I believe, with all my heart in this world, a, a foul Jezebel spirit, polluting the things of God and, and, and twisting and manipulating, trying to, the word of God and the spirit of God and bringing other stuff in. This is God's country. Amen. You can look at the founding father's words. Instead of what somebody has concocted in their minds to prove their point. And uh, Elijah got very discouraged and, and he went out into the wilderness. And I don't believe Elijah got discouraged so much in that, uh, that Jezebel said that she was going, going to kill him. You know, he never did die. He got raptured. And he shows up in, on the top of, Mount, of the Mount of Transfiguration with, with Moses and Jesus. So he made out all right. Right? And so I believe, now this is the, discourag the discouraging part here. I believe that he just got overwhelmed because the, the hardness of the hearts of the people. They should have favored God. Jezebel should not have had that, that kind of pull and that kind of um, power over them, but it's a strong spirit. It's an evil spirit. It eliminates anything in its way, just like we're facing now. Yes. It's the same spirit. And to watch these people see fire come down out of heaven and then not be phased and not go together and group up and, and run Jezebel out of town, I think it, it really discouraged him. Have any of you felt like that about our country? You know, you just sometimes you think, well, I just wish more of the country would wake up and, and serve God. I mean, how much more do they need to see? But you've got a large part of the country, they're, they're still not. But they're the harvest, right? We've got to go after them. But not just the people in the world. What about the Christians? What about the Christians that live like the world? And they're not moved. The Holy Spirit could come walking down the street with a red hat on and they wouldn't even recognize him. <laughs> I heard that somewhere. So <laughs> they wouldn't recognize him. They've con con congregated into... Um, Places not led by the Holy Spirit, but by familiar spirits. Familiar spirits looks like the real deal. Seems sort of like it. People can praise God and do this thing. But you know how you tell if it's of the Holy Spirit or the familiar spirit? Does it line up with the Word of God? Amen. The Bible does say there's a there's a people that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Amen. So let's read about Elijah because he, he really went through some discouragement and we'll see how God handled him. 
In 1 Kings 19, 4, then he went alone into the wilderness. Uh, 1 Kings 19, 4, New Living Translation. Then he went alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. So I believe right there he's feeling like he failed. I believe right there he's not recognizing the power and the anointing of God on this prophet man's life. And he's making it all about him because that's what discouragement will do. It will take it off of what God's called you to do and put the attention on what is happening to you at the moment. Let, let me just put it this way. If you're serving God and you're going full speed, persecution comes for the word's sake. You're not going to just get a free highway with lollipops and roses on the side. You know... <laughs> There's big, gigantic potholes out there. And there's scary things in those potholes. And I mean, this is a wicked world. And so, don't take your attention off of what God's called you to do, like he did for a moment. Look at verse 5. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree, but as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some Bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. Verse 7, Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or your journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Now, let me just stop there. The, this Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, is the same mountain that Elijah was in when he got the Ten Commandments. And the, the, Israel, the, nation, the nation of Israel had not been back since. And, and uh, I believe that Elijah ended up in the same cave or the same part of the mountain that Moses was in. It was called the mountain of God. Now, let me just say this. You don't have to go 40-day journey to the mountain of God. The kingdom of God is within you. But you do got to take a journey to find yourself and, and examine your own heart and, and, and um, see what the Lord has to say to you there. But look at verse 9. There, there he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? In verse 10, Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only left, and now they are trying to kill me too. That's his story. God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? See, remember when I said I think that Elijah's discouragement was because of the people, not so much of Jezebel, but Jezebel had a hand in it. But he says, look, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I am the only left, and now they're trying to kill me too. So verse 11, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And Elijah stood there, and the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I am the only left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Verse 15, then the Lord told him. Here's what the Lord's reply was. Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Saphat, from the town of Abel, Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. 
Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. So I love God's reply. This is a 40-day journey. Elijah's worn out, wiped out. He just needed time with God. That's a good step. That's the first step to take when you're discouraged. Get alone with God. And then there was a mighty windstorm, but God wasn't in the wind. There was an earthquake. God wasn't in the earthquake. There was a fire. He wasn't in the fire. It was the still, small voice. It was a gentle voice that God spoke to him with. And he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And after Elijah went through his whole issue again, very first thing God says is go back the way you came. Get back out there. Get in the fight. Go and anoint these people because these people will have the power of God on them. Go ahead and anoint Elisha and, and Jehu. Jehu's the one that brought down Jezebel. Physical, the physical Jezebel. And he said, look, I'm still doing a work in you. I, I'm still God. And don't get discouraged by what you see in, in the sin and the rebellious hearts. Just do what I've told you to do and I'll grant the increase. And then God answers his, his, his um, Elisha was wrong about he was the only one left. God said, I, got, I still got 7,000 men that haven't bowed to Baal or kissed Baal. So he was wrong on that point. We have to realize as a church, we're part of something greater than what we could ever, ever imagine. We are the body of Christ on the earth right now. And God has thousands and thousands of people just like us right now getting together, just right now, and he's getting the, the, the army together. Do you wanna be out in a desert under a broom tree? Or do you wanna be talking to God, getting back in the game, and doing what God called you to do? Did you give up on dreams because it didn't work out? Well, guess what? More times than not, it doesn't work out. Uh-oh. But when it does work out, it works out. Amen. You gotta fight for everything God put in your heart. It's not gonna come just because God put it in your heart. You gotta do it with all your might, all your strength. If you don't know you're on duty and you're on um, God, answering God's call, you're gonna fail. You're gonna falter. So you gotta get alone before God. God will speak to you the same way he spoke to Elijah. It'll be that still small voice. And he'll encourage you. But I guarantee you, you know what he's going to say? Go back the way you came. Go back and finish. Start where you stopped. Uh-oh. He's not going to say, well, you stopped back there. I understand it's a little bit difficult in that stretch. So I'll just move you around and you can start over here. You gotta go right back where you got off course. If God called you and you believed it with all of your heart, what changed? Your circumstance? How somebody treated you? The hardness of people's hearts? Come on now, I'd have quit 50,000 times if that was the case for me. What changed? God doesn't change. The Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You know what God wants you to be? He wants you to be excellent husbands, spiritual godly husbands and spiritual godly wives and mothers and fathers and grandfathers, but then he wants you to use your, your spiritual gifts in the church. If you have a gift to teach, then teach. You say, well, pastor, don't, well, come talk to me. I like when people talk to me. Sometimes people say, well, I was out of church for a month and you didn't call me. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were out for a month. But you didn't call me either. <laughs> you didn't call me and say, Pastor John, how's the church going? How's my beloved family of believers that God called me to be with. How are they doing? Is anybody in the hospital that I can pray for? How are you doing? How are the kids? I didn't get that call either. We fight about too many silly little things. If you got gifts and callings and talents, then do them. Stop getting discouraged. We know Sonona's called to sing. She's doing it. 
I, I tell this story, uh, we went to Bogota, Colombia, and somehow Sonona, myself, Leslie, and I think Sister Madeline, we were there too, and, and Clemencia, the, the, um, the Colombian translator, wonderful woman of God. That woman's tough as nails. And we're all in this house. And Sedona's right across the room, right across the hallway. It's like four o'clock in the morning, maybe, maybe earlier. And I hear her singing. <laughs> and I rode over the, to Leslie and I said, who sings at four o'clock in the morning? <laughs> and she says, well, I guess Sedona does. <laughs> I wasn't mad, I was just like, man, I, I still got like an hour on the clock here. I can get some more sleep. <laughs> and then Clemency was down below us and she's praying in tongues 100 mile an hour. Then she, I hear her. And I'm like, I'm already behind. <laughs> but what, what I'm trying to say is we can get discouraged. If you don't connect with pastors or leaderships, Try again. Going to give up? Oh, nobody understands me. Nobody appreciates me. <laughs> are you going to are you going to communicate? One gift that God has not given me and I'm glad he hasn't given me is mind reading. Like your parents our parents would say, Use your words. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, because I know it's important. But communicate. What do they think that can happen when they go to the pastor or leadership? We're going to, like, strike them down? No, we're going to encourage you. That's my job as the pastor, is to recognize the gifts by the power of the Holy Spirit and, and build you up so that you could do the ministry. And, and, and shine bright. But we can get discouraged. I've been discouraged all along the way, like I said. I'll just be honest. But I, I know how not to stay down in there. I don't stay out in the desert under the broom tree too long. Because I know that I know that I know that I know that God called me to stand here right now and to lead this church as a pastor. And that's what I'm going to do. Do you think people in the church haven't hurt my feelings? Remember, I was the tenderoni. <laughs> My very first sermon, somebody came up to me. Very first sermon. I said, it was pretty good, but you're not as good as your dad. <laughs> I said, well, I wouldn't hope to be. He's been doing it for 25 years, and it's my first sermon. <laughs> Did I quit? They said, God, you didn't call me because sister so-and-so said, I'm, I'm not that good. No, nope. the problem wasn't in me, it was in that person. Because what do you want your pastors to do? You want them to sing? You don't want me to sing. <laughs> do you want me to dance? Everybody knows pogues don't dance. Do you want me to juggle while I'm preaching? Early on, people, some people said, he's too quiet. So then when I ramped it up, people said, he's too loud. And I'm like, come on. And that's when the Lord said, you just be you. And that's all you got to be is you. God is putting the forces together right now. Are you under the broom tree? Are you discouraged? It's rarely the world that discourages the church people. It's the church is where they get discouragement at, in the church. Why? Why would that ever happen in a million years? Because we're all human beings in here, including me. God chose to do it this way. Ask him why he wanted to do it this way. <laughs> to use imperfect people and he believes by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we'll start to love each other. Because that's all we need to do is love each other. 
If you really, really, really love and honor me as your pastor, you won't ask me to preach a certain style. If you really love and honor the church and the praise and worship team, you won't ask for certain music. You'll sing what we sing. You got all week long to sing your country music. You can turn it up as loud as you want. Leslie likes it loud. And I've learned when I get in the car, I just do this first. (laughs) Because it knocks you out of your boots when you turn it on. (laughs) You know what? That's how she gets pumped up. That's how she gets psyched. Ready to go. Out there amongst the sharks. I don't need the music that loud. But she does, so she has it loud. (laughs) When did we get so finicky today? You're in the army of God. There is a battle raging. I'm telling you right now, there is a battle raging. And those people are dying every day and going to a place called hell. People don't even want to talk about hell anymore. Hell is real. And and now we have this form of a religion where there's no repentance. I know Jesus and I I believe who he is and I believe, you know, but I live my own life. That's not repentance. That's not going to get you into heaven. What gets you into heaven is you bow your knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You say, come into my life. I need you. There's too many people that don't think they need Jesus. They think they're okay because they know the story. I went to church when I was little and my parents sprinkled water on me. Oh, that's not baptism. That's sprinkling water on you. I know there's official names for it, but. You want to find out what condition the world's in? Go out there and ask them if they would die today. Why would God let them into heaven? And you will be surprised at what comes out of their mouth. I've heard it all. 90% of the time, I hear the wrong answer. Someone might say, well, there's no really no wrong answer. Oh, yes, there is. And they tell me things like, well, you know, I never, I try to never hurt anyone. And I try to live a, a good life. That's works. You're not getting into heaven because you're a good person. Or they say, well, you know, I belong to a church and I've been in that denomination for, for so many years. That's not salvation, belonging to a church. Where's Brother Gary? How long did you belong in the church? And you weren't saved. A lot of years. They sit there every morning and they never hear Jesus spoken. And they go through these little bulletins and they read these little things. And there's never no altar calls. There's never no moving of the Spirit. And they think they're okay because they went to church. You're not okay just because you go to church. You're okay because you put your faith in Jesus. Because Ephesians 2 says this, salvation is of faith through grace and faith in Jesus Christ, not of works. At least anyone should boast. Aren't you glad salvation, it, you, you can't earn your way there? It, it's, it's, it's a gift of God that comes when, to you when you say yes to Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you something. When you say yes to Jesus Christ, Something supernatural happens inside of you. You become born again in the spirit. In the spirit. You are a spirit being. You know that, right? That's God, God said, let us create man in our image. God is a spirit. We are, we are spiritual beings. We live in a body. And we possess a soul. Which is our mind and our will and our emotions and a part of us that connects to the natural side. That's the part that needs renewed. But if you have truly put your faith in Jesus Christ and accepted him as Lord, you're born again in the spirit. You have everything you need in you. Well, get baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's the next next step. Amen? And then you can go out and do the work. Do you think God called us to just sit by, just let things happen? We're we're called to be actively moving and, and flowing with the, with the Spirit of God at the moment. There was a man that had a vision of these last days, and then we're gonna close here. 
It was, the earth was full of trouble and turmoil, and he's looking down at the earth, and all of a sudden he sees something moving on the earth. He says, something is moving, it's large. And then he just kept looking at it, and then he could see it was in the form of a man. And it stood up, and it was a gigantic man, a gigantic body. And the Lord told him, he said this, he said, that's my end time church, rising up to, to, for this last push to get the harvest in. Amen? So we have to keep pressing on and don't get discouraged. Don't let the world get you down. Don't let, let people get you down, right? Sometimes people say, well, I went into the church and, and nobody talked to me. Well, did you talk to them? I'm only one person. I, I am a babier. I'm like a mother hen. I try my best, but I'm only one person. I can't tell what's going on half the time. You have to tell me. But, you, but Proverbs says if you want friends, you got to be friendly. I mean, we, we took like... Uh, 15 or so more people to Bogota, Colombia, a couple, several different times. And we go out on these streets to witness. And some, some of it's bad parts of town. And uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, for lack of a better word, extremely nervous. Because these, I'm like watching over them and I know what they're going to encounter. And I try to cover all the bases and I call, I call the pastors. You think, people think I'm quiet, quiet in some circumstances, but I can speak when I need to speak. And, and I pulled this one pastor aside and I said, look, we're going to go out on the street here. These people are learning how to lead people to the Lord. This, this uh, Colombian pastor and his, his helpers. I said, let them do the talking. And if... If they get stuck, or if something happens, or if you don't think they're doing it good enough, you bump them along, but do not do this. Do not take over for them. Do not leave them standing there like, oh, okay, I started, but he's going to finish, because he's got some kind of special anointing. No, he has no love is what he has. If you can't understand that these people are there stepping out in faith and taking a risk for God... This is how my mind works, and this is how it goes. We didn't always pull that off because that did happen sometimes in, down in Colombia. But we try not to let it happen. But you have to do your part. Don't you? You have to come to church with a smile on your face. If someone says something dumb to you, That happens. If it's, if it's rude or terrible or, you know, there's certain, there's different types of dumbness, right? <laughs> if you can deal with it, deal with it and love them, right? But if it's something different, talk to me, right? Talk to Leslie, talk to leaders in the church. Oh, man, I, I don't, and I'll close with this. I don't think the devil likes us too much. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> oh, my, if you could see what the Lord's putting in my spirit, what's coming down the pipe. And all this message is, is to get you out of discouragement, get you back in the game. Yes. Nobody has to sit on the sideline. Nobody. You don't have to be the water boy. Or the water girl giving the team water. You can be actively involved. Amen. You can be in the fight. This is the greatest fight in the history of the world. We're in it right now. Have you seen our country? <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but God laughs at man's ways. Oh, they got us backed into a corner. We can't say this. We can't say that. Uh, we're saying it. And we're moving on. Team Jesus, who's with me? So get going. And start doing what God called you to do. And you'll, you'll be very pleased with the outcome. That's all I have. Would you rise, please? Prayer ministers, come on up here.
This message was personal, personal to me because, like I said, I've, I've always been like on the sensitive side, and uh, I just don't like to um, hurt people's feelings, you know. And I still don't. But there's, there's a, there's, there's. Uh, how many believe that there's constructive criticism too? And leaders have to lead. And one thing the Lord told me when I first got here, He said, "You got to change because if you don't lead, someone who's not supposed to lead will lead." And I didn't call them to lead. But I, when I was younger, my dad saw it in me when I was real young, real sensitive. I, I was 35 years old before I figured out I was called to be a pastor. I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer as far as those things. I think the angels might have said, God, why'd you give us the dumb one back there? Because <laughs> can we just throw a rock out of heaven and pump him in the head? I'm talking about those things. You know, I just didn't, I wasn't spiritually keen because I did everything worldly. Didn't even know who I was. But early on, I remember my dad talking to me, because you know my dad, me and my dad's completely different in some areas. Dad's not worried about hurting your feelings when he talks to you. Just give you a heads up. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but he knew, he saw early on, and he started mentoring me and helping me. He, he would say, you're, you're too sensitive. And, and you know, because I would get in these sulking things for like months. And he helped me. What was in him is my dad and my spiritual leader helped me. Because you got to get tough. But you got to be obedient too. And you got to show honor. And then God will do the miracle. Prayer team's up here. If you need prayer, come on up. They'd love to pray with you. We've been hearing some great, great reports. I mean, God's always moving. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me say this. Come on up. Come up here right now and get in. Yes, amen. Why would you want to walk out without knowing Jesus? We've made it real easy for you. All you well, Jesus did. He died on the cross, right? But in this, all you got to do is everybody's going that way. You're coming this way. If you want to rededicate your life to the Lord... You can do that up here too. But whatever you do, get back in the game. Stop being discouraged. Amen. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. And he wants to do big time things through you and through us. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for these precious souls that are here. Father, I thank you that they are all wonderfully and fearfully made by you. And I thank you, Lord, for protecting them. I thank you for keeping them safe. I thank you, Lord, for watching over them. And Lord, I thank you that no virus can attack their body or no sickness or no disease, for they are redeemed from the curse of the law by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we lift up that name above all names, Lord. And Father, we thank you for our brother Leonard, Lord God, and anyone else who can't be here. Father, we're calling their healing in, in Jesus' name, Lord God. We are standing in the gap, and we are declaring, not on our watch, Lord, not on our watch. They are your children, and we thank you, Lord, for healing that body and healing others that are here, for, for, that, that are, are not here, Lord, for whatever reason, Father. Lord, we know we have rights and privileges as children of God, and we're going to stand up for them, and we're going to believe you for them, and the supernatural power of God will We'll bring the healing and the deliverance to, into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Our power tonight, if you can make it.